Amen. Thank you, Fran. Thank you so very much. I'll tell you, Fran is a tough woman. You know that? She's tough. I mean, I like to work out. I lift weights. I'm not messing with her. I have no doubt she could take me out if she wanted to. I love that song. It was a great message. Well, if you're wondering uh, what you're missing on TV tonight, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I can promise you that. Well, I want to thank Pastor for the privilege of uh, preaching these three Sunday nights. I still love and am energized by the quest for spiritual truth, eternal truth, and then bringing that to the family to share that truth, hoping that what's been a blessing to me will be a blessing to you. Let me just throw out a little by the way. By the way, we had some dear friends from, and long time friends from Marshalltown, Iowa here this morning. They just came up to the Des Moines area to visit and they stopped in and were a part of our service this morning. And uh, please pray for Marshalltown. I know many of you have been really moved by what you've seen, the devastation that took place there. That downtown Marshalltown took a direct hit. It's truly a, a wonder that no one was, was killed in that. But let's remember Marshalltown in our, in our prayers. My wife grew up there. That's her hometown. And uh, so we have a special place for Marshalltown in our hearts. You know, whenever there's tragedy and whenever there's uh, been a school shooting or a flood or a tornado, it seems like there are those now who are quick to scoff at the notion of prayer. In fact, would ridicule those who do the praying. I sure feel sorry for them, don't you? They really haven't discovered the uh, efficacy, the power of prayer. So have no doubts about it. Your prayers make a difference. Prayer does change things. Well, I hope you will, uh, I hope you will listen carefully tonight. I understand listening is difficult. Listening takes some effort, some discipline. Listening well is becoming a lost art. I have difficulty myself really listening. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. But I prayed and I have studied to make these next few moments together worthwhile. And if, if you will apply yourself, if you will make that effort to listen, I think you will find it worthwhile. We're looking at the third, uh, we're looking at three of the most important truths to know about Jesus. Um, pastor asked me to do a three-series sermon on Sunday nights, and I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. And uh, You know, there is an agony and an ecstasy in preaching. The agony is that hard part of what do you preach? Not that you don't have anything to preach, but there's so much to preach. Where do you jump in? Where do you even start? There's so much that is worthwhile, so much that would deserve our attention and our efforts in preaching. And uh, you always feel a little frustration with that, and I said, now I've got three sermons to prepare, have absolutely no idea where to begin, so, and I, I really don't like to go back and do things that I have done in the past, uh, how many years of ministry, let's don't go there, uh, too many to count right now. So I said, this is probably going to take two weeks to figure out the landing spot or the starting spot, where to begin. And I came into my Bible the Monday morning, and the uh, pastor had asked me just a couple of days before, and I op opened up my Bible to the, I said, you know, I'm really, I'm really uh, feel a, a gravitation toward the Gospel of John. I'm anxious to get into John and study John to get more in depth in my study of this wonderful gospel of John. Because John is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're all extremely important. No one more than the other, none less than the other, but John is a little different. Synoptic is talking about seeing together. 
And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. John's not a part of that because he, he sees it differently and he say, says it differently. So I was anxious to get into the gospel of John and I opened my Bible and, and within seconds, I knew I had my three-part series. Because upon opening John's gospel in the introductory verses, you are confronted with Jesus as the Word of God. And you see that he was the Word of God before the world. He was the Word of God who came into the world. He's the Word of God who saves the world. And then you, next you see him being proclaimed by John the Baptist as only John the Baptist can do. Proclaimed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now we come toward the end of the chapter tonight and we're going to look at the third message in this three-part series where Jesus is presented to us and discovered by others as the Son of God. Our text is found in John chapter 1, verse 43. Let me encourage you to either look at the overhead or at your Bible and stay with me because we're going to go through this verse by verse. Not going to be an outline. The verses themselves will give us the structure for this sermon tonight, but I thought the best way to learn this subject is as it is presented to us. Let's look at it verse by verse. John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. This was no simple or superficial invitation. This was not, let's do lunch. Or if you have a moment, I'd, I'd like to talk to you. In fact, I think there's more poured into the original language than we can easily or readily pick up in the English. Uh, the tense of the Greek was ongoing and continuous. This would really more accurately read, follow me and keep on following me. Continuous action. And uh, this was a command. It's not an invite. It's an imperative. Follow me. Now, no doubt there was something so incredibly, overwhelmingly compelling in the dialogue and demeanor of Jesus that it prompted Philip to respond as he did. But that's just the way it had been going. Jesus saw Simon Peter and his brother Andrew casting their nets as fishermen do, and he said, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And one of the gospel writers says that once they left their nets and followed him. Matthew was sitting at the tax collector's table because he was a tax collector. Jesus approached Matthew and he simply said, follow me. And the tax collector got up and he followed Jesus. And when the Lord came to Philip, he looked at him like no man had ever looked at him before. And he issued the same call. We've read it. There it is. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip, and that implies that he was looking for him, that he sought him out. There was effort in finding him. He said to him, you're the one I want. Come here. Follow me. And from that moment on, from that moment on, Philip became a follower of Jesus. Jesus was the rabbi, and Philip was the disciple. Jesus was the teacher. Philip was the student. Jesus was the master. Philip was the servant. 
But lest we think that Philip is a superficial man given to irresponsible spontaneity, we need to realize <clears throat> there was a history that preceded this encounter. Philip is not responding to a completely unknown man here. What was that history? Well, I think the gospel writer has provided us with that. It was, here he is again, the preaching of John the Baptist. What an impact John had. That voice crying in the wilderness. Now, so we're dropping in on a story that's in progress. You remember John the Apostle? A pretty tough guy himself. I mean, if you go around with the name Son of Thunder, I think you've got to be a pretty tough dude, don't you? He was known as the Son of Thunder, and I, he was loud, and he was intimidating. And this John the Apostle has introduced to us this John the Baptist, who made John the Apostle look like a sissy. John the Baptist lives in the wilderness with no creature comforts, only creatures. Living on bugs and honey, and he wears animal skins. Rambo, not Mr. Rogers. He didn't show up singing, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. No, he came out of the wilderness on fire, preaching, Repent! You brood of vipers, judgment is coming. So, John's powerful preaching had impacted the people of this chapter. Uh, note, if you would, in verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Down in verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which was translated as Peter. So there is this continual ricochet effect of the ministry of John the Baptist. And no doubt Philip had heard John and was in deep contemplation about what John had been preaching. So when Jesus showed up and presented himself to Philip, John had some background information. Perhaps he and Nathaniel had seen, or at least heard, how John the Baptist had pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So believe me, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God were working in the heart of Philip and in the heart of Nathaniel. Let's move down now to the next verse, verse 44 and 45. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So a stage is being set here for something. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So in verse 41, Andrew found Simon. In verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. One lighted torch lights another. Now, it's likely that Nathaniel was also known by the name of Bartholomew. Nathaniel's name is never mentioned in the other three Gospels, only in John's Gospel. And Bartholomew is never mentioned in John's Gospel. In each of the other Gospels, Bartholomew is coupled with Philip in the listing of the disciples. So most scholars believe that Nathaniel also went by the name of Bartholomew. Philip finds Nathaniel and he tells him, we found him. We found the one, the one and only one. The one Moses and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And he was the son of Joseph. Joseph was his stepfather. Philip didn't know about the virgin birth yet. 
And when Nathaniel hears what Philip has to say, he doesn't really like it. He's skeptical, skeptical it may, maybe even a little irritated. Uh, in verse 46, he says, What? What are you talking about? Nazareth? Are you kidding me? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You see, it's thought that there was probably a small-town rivalry between Bethsaida, where Peter and Andrew and Philip were all from, and Nazareth. And the people in Bethsaida didn't like the people in Nazareth and vice versa. They didn't like each other. They poked fun at one another. Each made the other the butt end of jokes. Their football teams broke out into fights. Besides, Moses and the prophets never said a word about the Messiah coming from Nazareth. So Nathaniel scornfully asked, you got to be kidding me. Get out of here. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. You want me to go check this out? I got to see this guy for myself. So he follows Philip to meet this man, this mystery, this Messiah. And then the weird gets weirder. In verse 47, oh my, the last thing he could have expected. Whew, you get that a lot with Jesus, don't you? When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. As soon as Nathaniel shows up, Jesus makes a statement that shows he's got him sized up. He knows him inside out. He knows him through and through. He knows him better than his brother. He knows him better than anyone else knows him. In fact, everything, everything Jesus says blows his mind. Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And Nathaniel asked exactly what any of us would have asked. Look at verse 48. How do you know me? How do you know what you're talking about? Look, we've never met. We've never had a conversation. How do you know me? Jesus said, in whom there is nothing false. The King James says what? In whom there is no guile. And the word guile translated Nothing false in the King James means deceit. So here's a man in whom there is no duplicity, no hypocrisy, no deceit. What you see is exactly what you get. This man doesn't walk around with any games or hidden agendas. The same Greek word is used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament originally in Hebrew. And it's used uh, to speak of that Old Testament character that we have had such fun studying about in my Sunday school class by the name of Jacob. And that word, guile or deceit, is forever associated with Jacob. In effect, Jesus is saying, now Jacob's name was changed to Israel to reflect the nature and the work of God in his life. In effect, Jesus is saying, behold a man, um, behold a man who is all Israel and no Jacob. And Nathaniel is taken aback that anyone could give a verdict like that on such short notice such short acquaintance. And don't you know the wheels are turning? How do you know me? I don't know you. How can you 
know someone you've never met. And then the weird that had gotten weirder that now gets the weirdest. In verse 48, the second portion, oh my. Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. The fig tree was leafy and shady. It offered a a degree of comfort, shelter from the heat, and privacy from others. In fact, many times people would go under the fig tree uh, to find that place of meditation and prayer and communion with the Lord. And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Well, more questions. You saw me? You, you, you saw me under the fig tree? Did someone bring this man binoculars? How could you be here and see me there? How can this be? Now, let me tell you what I think was going on. You don't have to agree with this. You can be wrong if you want to. But this is what I think was going on. Nathaniel was sitting under that fig tree, and he was thinking, and he was praying, and he was meditating. He was thinking about the Messiah. He was thinking about what he had heard John preach, the way John preached, and the what John preached. And as he meditates, his mind goes back to Jacob, And that ladder Jacob dreamed about, and heaven had opened, and a ladder had come down, and Jacob had seen the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. He called that place Bethel, and he cried out, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I never knew it. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Nathaniel thinks how wonderful it would be for God to step into human history like that again. And as he's meditating, thinking on these things, Philip comes, interrupts him, calls him, and says, Look, you've got to come. An Israelite in whom you've got to come. We have found the one. And so Philip takes Nathaniel to Jesus, and the first thing Jesus says, picks up right where he had left off in his thinking, an Israelite in whom is no Jacob. And in an instant, Nathaniel knows that Jesus knows him and that he knows what he has even been thinking and he knows the secrets of his heart. And he is dumbfounded. He is thinking, here is a man who knows me, a man who understands me like no other, like no one else could. Here's a man who knows all my thoughts and my secret prayers. Here's a man who sees into the secret chambers of my heart. Here's a man who can translate the unarticulated sighs of my soul. Here's a man who sees through figs and flesh, and he sees soul and spirit. And Jesus meets him in this critical moment, and he's saying, Nathaniel, I'm the one you've been thinking about, son. I'm the one you've longed for. I am the one of whom the prophets have spoken. I am the one that John is preaching about. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the gate of heaven. I am the true Bethel. I am the Lord in this place. And Nathaniel is immediately and forever captured by this one who reads him like a book. 
Verse 49, then, the, the, then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He's heard all he needs to hear. A few moments ago, hardly anyone could convince him that Jesus was the Messiah. Now no one could convince him otherwise. Andrew was right. We have found the Messiah. Philip was right. We have found the one Moses and the prophets wrote about. John was right. Behold the Lamb of God. And now Nathanael adds his confession of faith to theirs. Rabbi, King of Israel, Son of God. Look at verse 50. Jesus said, you believe? Because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You ain't seen nothing yet. You shall see greater things than that. Nathaniel, what you have seen today is, yes, it's reason enough to rejoice, to believe, to follow. But what you have seen today is small and meager in comparison to what you're going to see and what you're going to hear. Why, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. By the way, some would say that while Nathanael declared Jesus to be the Son of God in verse 49, Jesus only admitted to being the Son of Man in verse 51. He, in verse 51, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open, angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so they say there's this discrepancy that while, while Nathaniel gives claim to the fact that he's the Son of God, Jesus is saying, well, I'm just the Son of Man. Oh, man, I've got a brilliant threefold response to that one. Number one, don't devalue the term Son of Man. Don't miss its significance. It's every bit a claim of deity as is the Son of God. It has, it has its origins in Daniel 7 in the vision of the heavenly Son of Man who appears at the end of history on the clouds of heaven to exercise universal judgment and receive the worship of the nations. So yes, he is the Son of Man, and every man will deal with him. And when Nathaniel refers to Jesus as the Son of God, secondly, did you notice that Jesus did not say, mm -mm 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 -mm, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, I know you're sincere and you mean well, but you've got it all wrong. You've gone too far. Don't call me the Son of God. It's blasphemy. And in fact, in John chapter 3, in just a little bit, Jesus will say, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And then he says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Son of man and son of God. No, Jesus didn't say, you've overestimated me. I'm not all that. In fact, he says, I am all that and more. Stay tuned and you will see for yourself. That's exactly what he says in verse 51. I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What did he mean by that? What was he talking about? You ever read that verse and wondered? Because there was no time in his ministry when they saw the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, I think Jesus is prophesying in a beautiful and poetic way to Philip and Nathaniel that when they follow him, they will see heaven opened and heaven pouring out its blessing in unimaginable ways. They will see the evidence of angelic accompaniment in the routine comings and goings of his ministry on earth. But I also think that he's prophetically speaking of that day when Philip and Nathaniel 
and all of us will see heaven open and the angels of God at his side at his coming. Follow me. I'll take you somewhere. Follow me. I'll show you some things. Follow me and the kingdom is yours. What are we going to do with these words? Well, I'm going to cherish them. I'm going to keep them close to my heart. I'm going to hold on to them like a pearl of great price. I'm going to follow him. That's what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to follow him with the same sense of wonder and joy that must have filled Philip's and Nathaniel's heart. And I'm going to live in the expectancy that someday heaven is going to open and the angels of God are going to dance around the one Nathaniel called the Son of God. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen.